Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I am your host, Scott Ramp, here to usher you into the weekend. It is June 17th. It is the mid-month, and we are exactly uh, one month away from our summer camps. So if you have a kid who is interested in learning about media, filmmaking, making their own shows and all that stuff, uh, our animation camps are happening pretty much three weeks in July after the week of the uh, July 4th, which happens on a Monday. So we're going to take that week off. So Starting the 11th, the 18th, and the 25th, we have three different sessions of animation camp. Also, we doubled down and we're having a morning session and an afternoon session. So just a nice little overview of what MCAT's going to be up to. We also have our zombie camp this summer as well. It happens in mid-August, and you guys can find out more information by going on to MCAT.org. All right, let's talk about some news that is happening. Internet Explorer is officially dead. The internet hosting site, which has been running for 26 years, will be discontinued to make way for Microsoft Edge. So they made this announcement officially a year ago, is that they're going to stop, uh, uh, what's that called, uh, uh, working on or stop using uh, Internet Explorer. Uh, of course, maybe you might be able to get an Internet Explorer emulator to just do the old-fashioned way, but why would you? Microsoft failed to keep pace with competitors, and Internet Explorer began to lose respect among users for its poor security, bun uh, bungled renderings of web pages, and its sluggishness. So 2015 basically sealed Explorer's fate, much like Netscape Navigator in 95. It was the beginning of the end. Don't get me wrong, Missoula Library still has a fairly old system that can only run on Windows 10 and updating it will be difficult to run what's called workflows, which like Internet Explorer is past its prime. Uh, January 6th, yes, we're talking about January 6th because everyone else is talking about January 6th, but what did we learn? That former President Donald Trump behind the curtain could not lift a finger to help uh, former, pre former Vice President Mike Pence and was quoted in saying if Mike Pence was hung by the gallows, he did his typical Maybe, a maybe our supporters have the right idea. Mike Pence deserved it. But anyways, uh, this was brought up by Liz Cheney during the committee, who has uh, not relented uh, at her aim at Trump. And now uh, that the committee is in full swing and they're going to start wrapping up things up, um, she has also been using this platform to call it Republicans that are more loyal to Trump than the party and the people in them. Uh, one of the things that uh, recently happened, uh, of course, yes, yesterday they talked a little bit more about uh, uh, Vice President Mike Pence and where his whereabouts were during the January 6th with pictures, videos. Um, Forty feet away from rioters at one time, a former Vice President Pence navigated with staff to safety. Of course, I've met many people in Montana who still believe the election was stolen and without Trump conceding it has become a mess because as someone who just kind of read about George Washington by John uh, Ron Chernow, it's kind of interesting how just like they correlate with the times and it just kind of feels like a lot of this stuff kind of happens in waves is that just in general politicians even during those times took any and every excuse to throw George Washington under the under the bus but he was just so untouchable at a certain degree uh, with that in mind politics spend too much time throwing the other guy under the bus and it just ends up poisoning the swamp of future leaders. Anyways, as I get off my soapbox, I'll say this, both sides are terrible. Uh, the only good uh, thing down the pipeline is what's happening with uh, gun control and basically seeing a lot of partisan support from uh, some senators, uh, especially Republican senators, which are geared towards, which 10, which are geared towards putting more power to the states to enact red flag laws for individuals who may or may not seem stable when it comes to their first gun purchases. However, the main push is to protect the responsible gun owners and having just a little bit more pad to do background checks for the 18 to 20 year olds and potentially raising the uh, age of your first gun buy to 21. Uh, but then again, if you really think about it, how many 18 to 20 year olds do you know actually have somewhat of a record? So it's, it's a lot smaller compared to the older adults. But anyway, something is better than nothing and it seems real change is occurring at a pace beyond what I even imagined. I mean, I really thought they'd just hold this off until after the election or for the election's sake. 
to get more support for gun legislation and less depending on the national mood by then. So frankly, waiting for change has led to daily mass shootings even after Uvalde's uh, uh, um, Rob's elementary school. So, so far, they announced the following items in the bill. And so these are the, the main things is that support for crisis intervention, much like how Missoula has the uh, mobile crisis unit, uh, invest in children and family mental health services, protections for victims of domestic violence. Uh, well, that was one of the things that they also mentioned on a uh, article of John Stewart, that domestic violence is one of the leading causes of a lot of uh, police officers uh, getting killed in the crossfire. Uh, funding for school-based mental health and supportive services, funding for school safety resources, clarification of definition of federal federally licensed firearm dealers, so they're gonna crack down a little bit more on people who are uh, trading and selling guns, telehealth investments, penalties for straw purchasing. So uh, Senator Minority Leader Mitch McConnell says that if the framework remains in place that he'll support the measure by having states take point on red flag laws that would take guns away from folks who have a history of violence. Mental health is such a fluid thing as well. Some people's mental shortcomings have nothing to do with being responsible gun owners. So that will be debated for years to come about what it means to have certain things with that. So 30 years and assault weapon bans was nowhere to be seen. However, handguns are just as dangerous regardless of what is used. So we can all uh, have this debate uh, till the cows come home, but let's just kind of nip this in the bud and just kind of just do this. And I, I nitpick it so it's easy to fall between the cracks and basically get ignored. Uh, most mass shooters have similar profiles. Young males with nothing really going on in their lives are unmotivated and desire uh, more than they're willing to work for. So what we want to say, we should do more uh, than actually do more. So anyways, there's no magic words. There's no us versus them. We're all in this together. So I challenge my viewer uh, to make friends with the worst person in their minds and then maybe you'll understand yourself a little bit better. All right, moving on. Local business in Missoula, Butterfly Herbs and Spice turned 50 this year. And a nice story was written by the Missoula Current, uh, Kevin M Moriarty. Um, with, I'm sorry if I butchered that name. So with a uh, 1920s uh, general store vibe, the store has provided Missoulians with a single origin tea and spice in bulk for those looking for alternative items that can enhance local foods in Missoula, which I enjoy and I need a pound of turmeric for cheap. Uh, cooking, I cook with a lot of it too. So among other things, I have a, uh, it's also a cute little tea shop slash cafe that has always been busy with people chilling and drinking tea back in the day, the original owner of Butterfly Herbs, Bruce Lee, uh, who passed away in 2004, eventually sold Butterfly Herbs in the 80s after a fire in the basement caused significant damage to the store. However, Bruce and his then wife, Sherry Lee, went on to build a successful business of selling their bulk teas and spices that began as a small operation out of their garage. So today, Sherry Lee still runs Mo Montana Tea and Spice at 2600 West Broadway with about 10 employees and ships orders from over the United States, including what's one of the more famous ones, Evening in Missoula. So everyone in Missoula has been there at least once in our lifetime and for future uh, butterfly herbs, we can see it being a crucial part of Missoula's future for a little bit of a uh, uh, cultural taste. So as we've been uh, seeing trends of droughts in Eastern Montana, farms and ranches, this last week we saw dangerous levels of rain. So um, I took this video from AP News online. So if you guys want to take a quick look, these are some of the uh, high waters that are happening in, in uh, Yellowstone. So this is the entranceway, uh, Billings, kind of like one of the major cities. There's the states of emergency. Roads are being uh, basically torn out from erosion, mudslides and all sorts of just things. And you can see some cars in the top left hand corner as it's flying around is that Basically, that car is technically trapped by just the roads being collapsed and the, uh, the river's going so high. And, you know, just it's insane that they had basically um, three months worth of rain in three days. So it's kind of crazy just how much precipitation and uh, just the general heat caused by a lot of the rainstorms as well. All, um, and the snowpack runoff as well, it's just contributed to so, so much of this. And so you can really see that a lot of stuff's going on. And they just recently reported uh, on AP News, just give a quick update, is that a lot of places are cut off uh, just because of the flooding. And also, um, <clears throat> I also heard uh, uh, something to do with uh, their drinking water and some of the uh, uh, water treatment facility had to uh, hold off um, 
or uh, how to stop uh, treating some of the water because there's just too much in mass to deal with. So you can see just there's a lot of water and just a lot of area as well. And I wanted to kind of uh, skip and I wanted to kind of throw it back to this kind of like you can kind of see this general area. It's it, you just imagine like, you know, it's, it feels like a lot of this was like kind of like more valley than river. And if you take a, like a, a look for, from it from this perspective, you kind of see how much water is really filling up this particular valley next to the mountains. So yeah, there's a lot of water. And even after this is all said and done, like there still might be like record levels of drought even after the fact. So there's just, there's a lot going on. And there's even some videos of little houses and shacks just being pulled by the uh, just the immense uh, water that's going through there. So it's it's crazy. There's definitely a lot going on here. Um, uh, da -da. Yeah, it, they said they got 400% of the annual rainfall in the short amount of time, three days. Uh, okay, da -da -da. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy just with all this weather that's happening here. Um, I mean, we can even expect to be in the 90s uh, today here in Missoula and uh, yeah, it's, it's going to get warmer and I think it's going to get colder at least one more time before we start getting into the more, more full swing of summer. Because I always remember that there's always some kind of uh, bunch of different little rainstorms that just kind of happen out of nowhere. We've had a couple of those so far. We, uh, I had a hail near where I lived. Um, yeah, weather, kind of crazy. But anyways, uh, we're about a month away, like I said, from summer camps. And here is one of our promos for our summer camps. Um, for more information, like always, go to MCAT.org, and when I come back, we're going to talk about pre-critic. We're going to go check these out now. Once again, a hero rises. Yeah, so Horror Camp is going to be uh, popping this year for sure. So if you want to get your kids signed up for that, that is a great opportunity to get a full-fledged production of a film created uh, from womb to tomb, a uh, horror movie, that kind of stuff. So we're uh, great times with that. Um, let's talk about some movies that are coming out this weekend as I transition into Pre-Critic, where I prejudge a movie based on absolutely nothing but maybe a poster and a synopsis. Kicking things off is Lightyear. Hey, Pixar is making a movie about a toy that it's based on in a universe that is in Toy Story. So anyways, ever want to know a movie that's in, that inspired the Buzz Lightyear toy within the st toy Star Wars movie? Start, star, whatever. Uh, well, you're going to get it anyways. Uh, enjoy a blockbuster type film about an astronaut trying to get home, all the while trying to be hunted by forces of pure darkness, uh, Zerg. Um, so Buzz Lightyear, enjoy an annoying cat sidekick that will you'll want to punch and your kids will basically have their next minion for a while. Um, however, this cat is a robot and it talks. Enjoy yet another flagrant attempt to get your kids to be quiet for almost two hours. All right, and then we got this next movie. Oh, love those indie films where it's kind of quirky characters, Toronto Film Festival. This movie is an indie movie, so there's that. Take it. Take it what you will. Basically, this movie is about a guy who isolates from the world and doesn't become the Unabomber, but instead goes on a journey of arts and a reclusiveness that some people believe artists need to get inspired only lead towards the downfall of the man's psyche. But as he uh, goes into his uh, psyche, he creates a, a fake guy, and uh, hence Charles, and it, he basically makes it out of a box and like a hat and then kind of goes crazy, and then there's an actor that kind of portrays the box man. It's kind of like 
his perspective and then everyone else around us was like, dude, what's, what's going on with this? And that's kind of what the, the whole premises of this particular thing is. Okay, up next. Oh, I totally missed that one, but let's get out of the way, boys. It's the girls' turn to do another attempt at Peter Pan in this movie, The Lost Girls, which sounds like a sci-fi original series, but let's strap in and look out because Peter Pan is evil. Uh, can Wendy uh, the Third escape Pan's wrath in this chilling addition to Stockholm Syndrome, but with the magic of children? I mean, Peter Pan looks like he picked up a lot of his clothes from Target, and Wendy kind of looks like she wanted to follow her grandmother's footprints to a T. Uh, second fiddle to more interesting story, even better, is the this is a light novelization from an author who thinks Lost Boys was based on a Ruth B. song. That's a, kind of a sharp cut at some of the teenagers that I know. All right, as we dive into yet another series of movies, we'll show, we'll speed things up. So we're gonna get into the speed round. Kicking things off, we got Good Neighbor, Love Thy Neighbor, because they're covering up a murder of a hit and run committed, but hey, at least their friendship is solid, never confining someone in a crime. Um, then we got mid-century, Airbnb goes wrong. Who could have seen that coming? Usually the drama happens after the people leave and either the owner think they didn't clean enough or the guests ruined their home. All reasonable. Notwithstanding, this is a horror film. And then we got a video game for the last one. It's a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge. Enjoy yet another cash grab of this uh, satirized, uh, over-satirized, satirized Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles as they fight their way to Shredder. I mean, you can only tell a story so many times, but it follows the rules of four characters bouncing off each other. Without them, there is no Seinfeld show. There's a good, rep there's a good video rep uh, representation of how like ensemble um, shows and movies and all that stuff really uh, utilize a lot of the uh, elements of the four characters, the four archetypes like in Seinfeld. You got the emotional one. I, I don't know, I'm giving you this kind of video lesson about character development, but we got the leader. He's basically the reaction of reacting to everyone there and trying to kick them into shape. We got the angry one, Raphael, who's the one who's like, he's like, it's not going fast enough. We got to do something. And then we got the, the Mikey, who is the comic relief, the Kramer of the group. And then we got Donatello, the intelligent one, the, uh, I guess the Elaine of the group, but who knows. Uh, and those are uh, kind of like a little lesson on this character development. So without further ado, we're going to throw it over to a dub and stuff um, from the uh, comedy horror film One Body Too Many from 1944. Oh, uh, will someone clap? Oh, no, I'm not ready to get up. This isn't the kind of situation you were hit in the head and we found you no, on the ground. No, 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 no. That's just not so. It, it's not well, true. Well, it happened, and it is true. Oh, I can feel the bump. Let me up. This is so weird. Uh, do you see yeah, my blood? Yeah, everybody do you see I bleed on my hand? You should sit down. You've been through a lot. All I can remember was that I was just minding my own business, and boom, I got hit in the head. Can you believe it? You know, I can't believe that accent. Accent? Oh, no. Uh, I think this... this thing might have hit me. This is the reason why I have this accent. Should we call someone? Yeah, like a doctor. <laughs> Don't bite my head off. Okay, okay, so this fire poker hits me in the head, and suddenly I have this amazing accent. All right, all right, something more interesting is happening in here. What seems to be the commotion for you guys? Yeah, I heard someone do some kind of inappropriate accent. Well, you're the one to talk. Don't worry, I got this handled. <laughs> Darling, what seems to be the problem? Well, for all you should know is that one of us was attacked, and then there was a blackout. Must be attributed by the lightning. We heard the logical explanation, but can you provide an illogical I'll one? I'll find the uh, evil spirits in this house. You know, I heard about these spirits. They haunt these houses. All sorts of things like that. Spooky. Scary. Yes, we all know what you're going to say next. Hmm. So over here, he was attacked. But how could he have been attacked if there was no one else in this room? Old houses have old secrets. Perhaps there's an old secret passage. Yeah, that all seems too obvious. Perhaps maybe we can make it more complicated. What's your favorite color, and how does this have to do I with this? I don't think this has anything to do with anything, what we're talking about. He was attacked, and we have to figure out who did it. Did you look at the guy? Was he and strong? And here's another thing. I just want you to know that I'm on your side, and that you're my Will best you friend. Will you stop interrupting me? I'm trying to figure out this case right now. Well, I was just sitting quietly. Well, that solves the case. Let's get going already. I have to set a table. I have to get the food ready. I gotta do a lot of things. 
or better yet, I have to get other people to do the work for, and I have to keep an eye on them to make sure that they're actually working. So if you guys don't mind, I'd like to get this dinner oh, started. But what do I do about my accent? This head trauma is not no joke. But my grammar is still right. Perhaps maybe that it's not that bad of we'll a head have trauma. To keep an eye on him. I agree with that sentiment, but I'm still angry about this. Well, perhaps getting some food inside your bodies will make you less angry and maybe uh, deal with your emotional problems. And just don't talk if you're worried about your accent. Brrr, here comes the tea train. Everybody wants some tea. Everybody gets some tea. It's a great tea. All sorts of things uh, around. <laughs> Non-caffeine. <laughs> well, I mean, that was like awfully quick that we got this tea all of a sudden. Seems awfully convenient. Let me tell you there. Well, tea is exceptionally easy to make. Don't you understand that? Indeed. You just standing there drinking your tea like nothing's wrong. There's something wrong here. Oh, I don't like that tone. I'm gonna get you. Yeah. Oh, down. My accent. Oh, it's gone. Oh, oh, it's gone. Oh, 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 is that a dead body? Oh, yes, indeed, it is a dead body. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's jump right in. We're talking a little bit about the school board. Yes, I usually don't cover the school board, but this time I'm talking a little bit more about um, what's happening within the school board. And just a little bit of news uh, is that the uh, school board decided to uh, kind of change the policy and how they do their dual language program in Paxton Elementary. The parents were furious about it. Not necessarily about that they weren't uh, allowed to uh, be part of the discussion, but mostly because they were told kind of last minute that they were going to change this policy going into the next school year of 2022 to 2023. So here's an example of some of the public comment on this proposal. And these are some of the parents who are concerned that their uh, kids are getting some education uh, benefits taken away from them. Um, as parents and supporters of students at Paxson, we as parents come here tonight and I'm gonna ask you and we are asking you for three things. One, I'd like you to deny this motion, um, Watson's recommendation to eliminate the DLI program at Paxson right now. Two, I'd like to engage and identify a collaborative, transparent, expert process that addresses the changes, if any, that need to be made at Paxson. And three, I'd like to effectuate that process together. What about board policy section 2159 about allowing families to partner in the decisions about programs? It seems like the real question before the board now is, do these policies matter? Shouldn't all stakeholders be required to follow them, even an outgoing superintendent? Or are the policies meaningless? I believe if you'd vote to eliminate dual language immersion at Paxson, that sends our community the message that those policies don't matter. And the next time an issue comes along at one of my kids' schools, maybe I shouldn't look to MCPS policies for help. If the board votes yes to Watson's recommendations, it will set a precedent. It will send the message that if board policies are violated, it doesn't matter. If some people want to make a school change, they can go ahead and they can do that without following board policy. It will send the message that if there are outstanding grievances, it doesn't matter. It will send the message that curriculum decisions do not need to be based on data and research. It will also send the message that student and parent opinions don't matter. Robitaille's own survey shows that 86% of Paxson parents think DLI benefits their child. We also want to read the parent survey comments but we've been denied access to those. 230 parents petitioned to include us in the decision-making process. 98, I think it's over 100 now, parents signed a formal grievance against Watson. Students started their own petition to keep DLI that was totally ignored by teachers, principal, and superintendent. Not only is the program popular with parents and students, it works. I feel like this is a true accomplishment of public education, especially when I consider how I was taught Spanish and French in high school in a 45-minute lecture twice a week. I'm sure many of you are in that same situation and maybe consider how much of the language you actually retained. The reason why parents feel so passionately about the great education that they, we feel our kids have received at Paxson is because we believe it will help them and allow them to flourish. Um, if 
I were a privileged person. There are many privileged people here at our school. That's certainly the case. There are a lot of people with a lot of money here who go to school at Paxson. Those people could very easily go to MIS and get a dual language immersion um, education. Unfortunately, I'm not one of those people. I don't have that kind of money. All right, so then you have a kind of a retrospect of exactly how a lot of people were, uh, in, were just not happy about this uh, deal. There were quite a few parents who were not happy about uh, the, the teachers going behind their backs and coming out with this change in their popular uh, dual language program. Mainly the teachers met for months until they uh, let rumors of this spread through the community, which resulted in a panel which MCAT filmed recently. Um, MCAT covers a couple MCPS things, uh, mostly the board meetings, but this was a very special uh, deal in which they wanted to be uh, transparent. Uh, unfortunately, that uh, meeting actually happened a week or two before this initial board meeting where they voted to, uh, dis uh, to basically change the dual language program completely and now just uh, offer it as a 45 minute class that they happen every uh, week or so. But a lot of the uh, uh, motivation behind this has to do with uh, the fact that a lot of kids at Pax Elementary were uh, being left behind. There was a big gap in terms of uh, education um, availability, especially during the pandemic, a lot of kids were left behind education wise. So this is just a, another montage of, uh, of um, public comment and staff members uh, talking about uh, the reason why they came to this decision. Um, a few years ago, I was asked to be a part of the DLI task force. This was a group of teachers, administrators, and a lot of parents. Um, there were only two Paxson teachers on this task force, um, but there were very a lot of parent voices on the committee. Um, the same voices that you're hearing from tonight and have heard from in other board meetings. Um, it was extremely intimidating to speak up in front of those parents and it was impossible to um, tell them the whole truth about the struggles and uh, the struggles of you know, many of the students that we were failing. Um, it became obvious to me that <clears throat> these parents would do anything to save the program, even if it meant we had to turn kids away from Paxson, even if it, we, it meant that we had some kids that cried every single day when they went to Spanish class, even if it meant that some of our kids in third, fourth, and fifth grade were still struggling readers, even if it meant we had to cut out science, social studies, and writing, um, and even if it meant that we would lose some of Paxson's most treasured teachers. It is incredibly hard to get up and say, my child is struggling. It is incredibly hard to put that on public record, to, um, to ask for the data and really, like there's certain things that are anonymous and supposed to be, people don't want that. And to expect those things and to think that you deserve to know about how many kids have these issues, to think um, that you really wanna know how many people are displaced. That's just really asking to put people on the spot, people who already don't feel comfortable speaking up and advocating for themselves. And so that's why the teachers are here, because we are advocating for the people who don't feel like they have the power to advocate for themselves. Superintendent Watson was an amazing facilitator. His fair and unbiased attitude made us feel valued and safe. For some of our staff members, it was the first time to truly feel that. In many meetings over the past nine plus years, many of my colleagues did not feel comfortable bringing up the flaws in our current model. They were sometimes labeled as anti-Spanish or anti-second language um, education. Such divisiveness, along with genuine concern for our most vulnerable students, have caused many staff members to transfer to other schools in the district or choose early retirement. I know of at least seven staff members we have confided in myself and other colleagues that these were the main reasons for their departure. I think that when we look at the numbers of students who are in special education, that does not include the number of struggling learners that we have. There are many more struggling learners than are represented in that special education percentage. And by the way, you know, we also have some crossover between our very gifted learners and our special education students. So we have some very unique learning needs at Paxson. And I think that this model is elegant in its ability to meet the needs of all of those learners. Um, I was stunned to see the history of how differently immersion has looked from year to year to year and that truly this 50-50 model that folks are feeling really passionate about and I, and I hear that passion is only a couple years old school-wide. Um, that's not a model that kids in Paxson have had 
really across the board in the school for a very long time. There's been a tremendous amount of shifting and changing and tweaking as, as the dedicated staff have tried to figure out how to make it work. Um, I'm the first to admit that um, I'm, you know, I much rather would have used a different process, taken longer to make this decision. But I go back to that urgency issue that I shared with you in that data. We've got kids at the school in the pipeline that need help next fall. And that means we've got to do something different with our schedule. Um, so last thing I'll say, this decision was reached because of decisions related to curriculum, required minutes, the needs for interventions, and the accessibility issues for all kids. Um, Administrative-wise, we support the decision, and that's why I made the recommendation to allow Paxson to move forward with their plans to change the model. All right. So there you go. There's, uh, the end was uh, Superintendent Rob Watson. This, the program isn't dead, but the opportunity to start a second language in the K through fifth grade uh, Paxton Elementary School will remain in the form of a single class rather than teaching math and science in the second language. Um, education in public schools are tricky, and uh, you have to find ways uh, to figure out how to work with many of the cooks that are in this kitchen, both administratively and teachers, and he heck, even the public as well. Uh, mind you, taxpayers have a lot of stake in public schools, regardless of if their kid goes there. And with that, uh, have uh, the disadvantage of politically motivated changes. So, um, however, all structure aside, the school board voted to uh, change the dual language immersion program as they see it. Just because they changed it doesn't mean they can't change it again. So think about it like that. Um, perhaps maybe there is a saving grace in the future to uh, continue this program moving forward. And um, yep, so that's what I had to say about school board. Uh, I just wanted to give a little note of kind of what's happening in our town as well. Um, sometimes I usually don't talk about that. I usually skip even uh, the county commissioner's meeting in which they had a pretty uh, um, big meeting last couple uh, weeks or so. So I'm kind of, I kind of glo I didn't really talk about about that. And, my, and I'm gonna uh, dive right into uh, some city councils. One of the things that I also wanted to mention is that today is uh, basically uh, Bill Campbell Day, which is part of the We the People Act, which was part of the uh, 50 year anniversary of the Montana Constitution, which invited local Montanans and not politicians to draft the con Constitution, all while keeping both political parties out of the citizen run committee. This Constitution of Montana was put in place 50 years ago and people involved spoke about this in the city council. Mr. Hunt spoke about the father of this We the People uh, Montana Constitution, Bob Campbell, who co-wrote the Montana Constitution. So here is Mr. Hunt, um, as soon as I find the clip. Here you go. I'll tell you what, he would be thrilled to death right now to know that June 17th of all days was going to be the day declared in his honor. You know, it was 1974 and this during this week that Americans were transfixed by the Watergate hearings that were televised and um, and conducted by Congress. It just transfixed the nation and of course led to Nixon's resignation. Well, I can tell you there was no Montana who was a greater advocate of impeaching Richard M. Nixon for the constitutional crimes that were revealed uh, as a result of the Watergate scandal than Bob Campbell. And uh, what's interesting about that is that the Watergate burglary took place on June 17th, 1972. So this would, uh, he would be laughing and maybe perhaps he's uh, laughing from beyond the grave right now uh, because you have declared that day to be his, his day. All right, so that was Mr. Hunt talking a little bit more about that. I didn't get his full name and I, I feel bad about that. I wasn't able to find it in the median as well. So, so much set the tone for our constitution which carried over to today by uh, protecting the basic human right and dignity of Montanans. Privacy was an emphasis on this as well in terms of amendments. This is the one of the few state constitution that has not been amended or changed in over 50 years. So it's been pretty solid for a lot of uh, uh, Montana uh, politics and legislatures and all that stuff. Up next, we have a, a new way of recouping costs when it comes to your water bills and water rates and fees by putting this on the homeowner for uh, rentals that are unable to pay their water bills. So there's a big change within the city of Missoula to basically go after the uh, landlords um, who are renting out to uh, renters who can uh, pay for their water bill. So it's interesting and John Contos uh, 
is a disagreement on how the uh, water company is going about um, collecting their uh, fees. I feel like there needs to be some other options rather than putting this back on the homeowner. Um, I'm not quite sure what the thinking is, but if you use water, you should pay for it. And if you can't pay for it, it probably needs to be turned off. Um, I think a lot of times people think because someone owns a home that they're wealthy and that they can handle all the responsibilities. Uh, not quite true. Uh, it's like when someone doesn't pay their rent, the mortgage still needs to be paid and that falls back on the homeowner. Um, also, I just don't feel like this is a Montana value. This is a hardworking state and uh, we work hard for what we get. So to pass this on to the homeowner, it's not fair. All right, so that was John Contos ta um, uh, um, airing his grievances about this. Um, the water company has to get paid and for the city council simply turning off the water is not the best solution at this particular time. The infrastructure of our water system is not good um, in terms of just going to each individual people who don't pay the water bill and just turn it right off. And also one of the things that the uh, city council takes a stands, all, stands on is that water is a human right and they wanted to work on this as well. So in terms of state laws to back up this new policy and the city doesn't have to pursue the private agreement among the homeowner and renter. So a lot of times it's like, you know, the renter can kind of, um, I hate to say this, but screw over the uh, homeowner by not paying the water bill. And then, you know, the, the, the house in which it's owned, it's the water. And so whatever private agreement you have with your uh, renter is, it's like you'd have to go into a civil case against them if they don't pay their bill. So it's interesting. It's kind of like they're uh, basically uh, removing kind of responsibility and just being like, hey, just feed them until they can't pay. And then, yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting. It'll, it, it's 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 the whole idea is like it's kind of like when you let someone drive your car and crash it the it, it's insured but the payment falls on the owner of the car and you'd have to settle those costs with your friend outside of the insurance so as someone who works at the library in MCAT most of the stuff here is free until you lose slash damage the property in accordance with the agreement we have with individuals here at the library so it's interesting how they're going about doing this it uh, makes sense, but it's also just garbage. So Logan McGinnis, uh, he's with the water company. He's an engineer. He talks about the pitfalls of taking away water services of the people. I mean, certainly there are challenges with, you know, with the process of shutting off water. You know, we've got hundreds, if not thousands of curb boxes in town that don't work. And so it's a pretty idle threat to say, we're going to shut your water off and we can't physically do it without, you know, having to tear up the street to replace their curb box. So, I mean, there are complications with shutting water off other than, you know, in addition to the concern about taking away people's water service, you know, in terms of the process for collecting, I think we've, you know, it's outlined in state law and we'll follow it in terms of a legal notice and, you know, give the property owners time to resolve this. And, you know, it, the, the way it really works, you know, we, they have at least 30 days, but as I understand it from talking to Judy Anderson, our kind of expert on past wastewater liens, you know, it, it you know, the final list is developed in mid-September and then the, the liens would be filed around October 1st. So, you know, they really have two to two and a half months to, you know, get the account taken care of. Okay. So, um, <laughs> yeah, in layman's terms is like, uh, our water system's so broken, they can't even turn off the water. So basically they don't want to be the bad guys and turn people's water off and would just end up sending a bill to the property and advise the landlord that the sites have not paid water when it becomes delinquent. Uh, this could also open the door to evictions, which in the past your water is turned off and you can pay it to get it back turned on, but at least the landlord didn't have to get involved. As a landlord myself, I'd be ready to evict my tenants if they accrued any of these bills. But anyways, the city uh, voted in favor of updating this ordinance. Thus, the water company can now notify homeowners in the renter-occupied venues that fail to pay water within the two to three months. So, all right, so that's kind of what's happening there. Um, we're going to jump right ahead to the budget committee and they spoke about the mayor's key items he wants to fund going into fiscal year 2023. Angela Simonson, budget admin and staff, spoke about JEDI, which is that uh, uh, justice, um, equity, uh, diversity and inclusion. And so this is uh, Angela Simonson. The JEDI initi uh, Strategic Initiative Work Team is the only team left to, to complete that initial training. Uh, and, um, but all leaders in the city and including uh, key members on these work teams have gone through initial training with our uh, consultant consilience. 
Uh, and all of those you'll notice have the black check mark. So referring back to the key that Eric just mentioned, that means that we have accomplished these, that, that we have met the, the initial goals for these. The final item in this top section you'll see has the green uh, path or road. Um, and that is the internal culture uh, survey. That's a workplace culture survey, uh, sometimes referred to as an employee engagement survey. We launched that next Monday and it will run until July 25th. Uh, so we are on track to do that. And I look forward to being able, being able to present the results of that to you in coming months. All right, so uh, they're gonna talk about some of the, uh, 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 the process and as the program progresses, they aim to look uh, to uh, look at how the program has impacted staff and to understand the economic divide that it is affecting Missoulians specifically. Um, for my economic growth in Missoula, I can plainly, plainly say that the cost of living has gone up and businesses are trying to get the minimum wage up to $15 an hour and also addressing the housing prices and being able to afford reasonable homes and not just the moniker of affordable housing, which is relegated to those who who make 120% the area income with an emphasis on couples to earn her households for the affordable housing. So, sorry, but the reality is that Missoula is trying something, but the short-term success usually turns into long-term headaches if not addressed at the grassroots level. These meetings will uh, dive into the budget and how many is spent uh, and will be planned to be spent. Uh, Eric Hallstrom, budget admin staff, spoke about priorities and uh, it achieving excellence. High on the priority list is to um, nail down a city uh, IT uh, modernization and security strategy that allows us to make the kind of forward mo movement that we need to make in a safe and secure way that is thoughtful about the long term costs and uh, city needs. Uh, we have high priority system upgrades that will be um, part of, of the way we think about our modernization strategy from financial systems to our HR management systems and many others. We will, um, these are really both end type, uh, type items because we're gonna, as we do those modernizations, we will be moving to cloud-based solutions that help us improve that security, reliability, uh, and hopefully manage costs. Um, and we will continue, as I mentioned, the project blueprint work to, uh, to develop and deploy a broader um, uh, course, a set of systems for us to, uh, to do our work together, to collaborate across departments and across teams, uh, and to be as effective as we can and minimize some of the overhead that goes into uh, getting our work done. Okay, and part of this is that, you know, as technology is improving, and not to mention the, the fact that the city has been using Zoom and doing um, quasi-hybrid meetings, they want to figure out a way to uh, incorporate technology and moving forward. And also a fun fact as well is that a lot of the funding for the ID department comes out of MCAT's uh, annual budget. Um, MCAT's budget is based on uh, cable subscriptions, so if you're watching this on TV, thank you. You're basically uh, helping to provide MCAT and local Missoula programming here from Spectrum Cable. Also, the city has to be careful because IT only takes one person on staff to release um, sensitive information via the cloud. And there's, uh, there was a couple years ago when one of the local high area high schools released the high school athletes' private information. So it's interesting as they're moving forward with their technology, and I don't wanna like, that they know what they're doing for sure. Um, so that's basically what they're doing with the bare bones is they're trying to figure out how to improve technologies. And a lot of the computer systems in place use uh, apps and programs that have been running since the 90s. So it's, it's definitely a, 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 an adjustment. And with uh, the uh, pandemic, technology has been basically crucial when it comes to creating these kind of uh, um, basically uh, leaps and bounds in technology. So Aaron Pian ties into affordable housing and using redevelopment to leverage costs. And so here's Aaron Pian. Another uh, success that isn't completed, but is, is in motion with some risk factors in place due to just the unpredictable nature of labor supply and construction pricing right now is our public-private partnership to develop the former White Pine Sash site, um, which we've been referring to as the Scott Street project or development. And this includes a mix of neighborhood commercial opportunities, rental homes, and permanently affordable for sale homes under a community land trust model. Looking forward into the next fiscal year, we want to continue to focus on this goal by positioning the sleepy insight for redevelopment, either through private development or a public private partnership 
either of which help us achieve our stated goals in the area of housing and redevelopment. And if you haven't already, we heard, also want to oh, and the, if you haven't already heard, the Sleepy Inn is also one of those um, uh, motels that the city is going to be buying through the uh, federal grant that was provided to help veterans um, in Missoula, especially homeless ones, and so they can have a uh, temporary. Uh, um, shelter out of the shelter as they transition out of homelessness and they're going to be utilized in the sleepy in motel so that was one thing they really uh, harped on last week uh, or i talked a little bit more a lot about last week towards the end of my city council report jason white chief of uh, police um uh, we're they're, they're, they're going through a lot of topics but these are a lot of the priorities and so jason white chief of police spoke about public safety and the wellness a couple of years ago we uh had an increase in our in our budget for providing training to our officers and and uh, department employees and we've through the last year and a half we've been able to implement uh, a strategy that now has tripled the amount of training officer training hours that our officers receive uh, so we are doing a great job of providing post certified training to our folks and that allows us to have uh, more professional uh, police staff we implemented the reserve officer program which allows us to provide security for municipal court and for city council with the use of reserve police officers instead of using full-time police officers, which allows us to keep our full-time police resource available for handling calls and in the field. And we, and we implemented a new uh, recruitment tool uh, that provided us with a nationwide reach to try to uh, capture a wide variety of candidates to come to the Missoula Police Department. We have just finished the, the first year of this tool and we are currently evaluating its effectiveness to, to determine whether or not we would like to continue with this service or try another service. So that is why that is still on the path and we continue to work at that. All right, so uh, that is just an update on um, what's going on with the police department and how they're gonna be utilized in the budget. One of the major things is that the, uh, in cases of emergency through the mobile crisis unit, which works with the fire department and their training to help those going through mental health crises that don't need police, which are employed to control the situation, protect others from the individuals, but this system is added to, uh, need care, I mean, is added for the care of folks struggling with various uh, mental health episodes. Another item was geared towards green spaces and trying to get mixed use of green space near higher density dwelling that doesn't have immediate access to parks and trails. By addressing that, they plan, in, they plan to invest in more green spaces. Overall, they want to continue the, uh, the things that work and invest in, uh, further in uh, proven policies that help, but also addressing things that don't. Budget communities are long, boring meetings, and I hope you got a kind of a sense of where your tax dollars are being used for. So public safety and health. During this meeting, they looked into the plant practices and looking into improving the ecosystem that promotes stopping further harm from criminalization of ethiogenetic plants and fungi. So basically magic mushrooms. I'm actually not gonna get into the presentation because it covers some of the health benefits and history of the war on drugs and so on. I mean, if you wanna get an argument for the sake of mushrooms and stuff like, and psilocybin, just watch Joe Rogan, seriously. Daniel Carlino is one of the few, uh, was one of the city council members spearheading this meeting and advocates for removing uh, criminalizing um, mushrooms. So this is what he had to say. These current laws are punishing people that are low income and people of color dis way disproportionately more than wealthy people or white people in the United States. And I think that's really important for us to think about and let that set in and think about how our policies are disproportionately harming the most vulnerable populations currently. All right. So that was Daniel Carlino uh, giving his two cents on, on the matter as well. Legalization of cannabis and marijuana has led to many to look into laws of the past, which was heavily motivated by politics and the presenter in the subject. Uh, Dr. Larry Norris talks a little bit more about uh, the decriminalization in the on the in the nation. Uh, what's really impressive about this movement is that uh, you know it, it, there's communities in every one of these cities that are you know have had um, personal experiences of transformation, of personal and spiritual growth, of healing, and they're all willing to come forward to the city council to say, hey, what can we do to help our community out? What can we do to make sure that there's alternative mods of um, models of healing for us uh, that don't necessarily uh, you know require high high costs or um, you know uh, regulatory frameworks that most people can't fit into. Um, as you see there on the, the map, we also have about 
50 other cities that are currently active, uh, working to decriminalize in uh, their city. We're working with state legislation in Michigan and Colorado, uh, working with some folks in Vermont for state legislation as well, and for some in California. All right, so that was uh, Dr. Jim Norris talking a little bit about that. And to basically shut it all down is uh, Chief Jason White, who uh, says that he's uh, completely opposed to this position that the city um, and Darnia Carlino wants to take. This resolution contains flaws that will impact our ability to enforce other drug, drug laws and lead to unintended consequences. The provision that the city, quote, shall not use any funds or resources to assist in the enforcement of laws for the use and possession of entheogenic plants by adults as a standalone offense, end quote, could jeopardize the 300,000 in federal funding we receive annually to run the Missoula Drug Task Force HIDA operation. This prohibition would prevent the personnel assigned to this task force from assisting our county, state, and federal partners under the conditions of this resolution. It could also jeopardize the long-term working relationships we have with our partner agencies. The potential loss of funding and working relationships could impact our ability to maintain a productive and functional drug task force. Okay, so that was uh, Chief Jason White um, talking about the laws that are in place. Hey, and a lot of times you got to understand that uh, crimes in Missoula related to drugs, um, according to White in the presentation he made last year, was 80% of crimes in Missoula, uh, according to the annual report. Uh, by Jason. I, I mean, I spoke on this and, and to my surprise was uh, kind of crazy to uh, see that use. Uh, of course, Chief Weiss also rolled up mushrooms with more severe drugs like meth, fentanyl, and other dangerous drugs to make his point, but his job is to enforce the law is that are in place and not have personal opinions on the matter. So Health Department Director DeShane Bar Barnett talks about this sensitive matter and kind of uh, speaks on um, kind of like as an as himself, and anyway, so the, he's the director of the um, Mon Missoula um, Health Department. This is a rapidly changing area uh, of clinical study, and there's reasons for that. There are, are reasons that this was not well studied over the last 50 years, and it's just beginning to become well studied. Um, but what I need to say is that the health department, through the Board of Health, does not have an official position um, on this issue. So when I'm here today and answering questions. I'm only speaking for myself. I am not speaking on behalf of the Board of Health or the Health Department. We have not adopted a, an official position on this at this time. Um, what I uh, know of this topic, um, it does relate to you know my, my research area of focus. And based on the available evidence in public health, we, we cannot say that there are no public health benefits associated with entheogenic plants. But we also cannot say that there are no public health risks or concerns. And I wanna make sure that, you know, that that message is clear is that, you know, when it comes to this topic in public health, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. This is not cut and dry that this either absolutely is 100% beneficial or it's 100% horrible. That's not the, the state of the science right now. All right, so one of the main things that they uh, have to work on moving forward is not necessarily uh, decriminalizing across the board, but necessarily figuring out a way to uh, come up with a policy to prevent any kind of abuse and underage use. And that's one of the things that they move forward on when it came to uh, legalization of marijuana in the state of Montana is that they had to develop a lot of policies, um, records, and, with an, and also um, uh, damages in terms of, um, uh, what's that called? Uh, God. I'm trying to think of legal mumbo jumbo off the top of my head, but the, con the concept of um, basically with the intention of selling X amount of um, product that you bought from just a recreational use, there is certain felonies for um, X amount of, I think if you sell like an ounce or over like two grams, then you're, uh, you, you can have uh, small misdemeanors uh, here and there, but when it comes down to it, like it's still federally, um, illegal um, comparatively. So um, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to lump up uh, um, these uh, magic mushroom type of uh, things um, in with marijuana. But anyways, this is, it's an interesting kind of public health input and strategies to curb the underage and dangerous consequences of the substance. And now is getting some real research kind of getting done. And um, at, in the end of the meeting, um, you know, you cannot change state law from, a, from the city, um, but Jim Nugent, city attorney, um, speaks on the laws surrounding this particular uh, item. 
And it's important to also note that the city government may not adopt any state law or any resolution, local regulation that pertains to felonies. So if there was a felony involved, the resolution couldn't apply to anything involving a felony offense. In addition to the sheriff and the county attorney not being bound by this, uh, the drug team task force are not bound by it. University security are not bound by it. The highway patrol are not bound by it inside the city limits. So uh, in part, it might be giving a false sense of status or security uh, with respect to what the actual situation is inside the city limits. And so just as a reality check, people need to realize that all these other entities, they're not bound or influenced in any way by the city council resolution. And that basically, the primary message was work with the police department, learn the real facts from the police department and coordinate with the police department about addressing this in the future. All right, there you go. Uh, so that's Jim Nugent uh, speaking on behalf of that. Uh, the main takeaway from this was basically address the issues of public health issue and not necessarily the criminal, throw them in jail, one, and get them the help they need to be able to get back into society. Oregon basically did this whole uh, um, decriminalization, but also uh, incentivized people who are um, uh, basically addicts to certain substances to offer them like, hey, you know, here's uh, either you uh, pay a fine, go to rehab, or we throw you in jail for certain uh, things. So, and a lot of, it's, it's interesting. <sighs> Yeah, I don't want to get too much into it because I don't have too much information about this just based on the city council report. So, however, uh, getting to the roots of this over the course of the last 10 or 20 years, prescription drug overdoses and misuse are on the rise regardless, which makes you think that everyone's situation may already be in the drug infested world that we feared through the war on drugs. So regardless of whether something is legal or illegal, I mean, even some of the legal drugs are uh, becoming more and more just like eyebrow raising. So another item was the organization. Welcome Back is a community of people returning to Missoula, Montana after incarceration. Um, this is a, uh, they went full in depth with this a little bit more about the public safety and health community meeting. I don't have any quotes for you guys because I am running out of time. I just want to count that they're talking about how to weigh ways to reintegrate people into society when they paid their debt to society. Hey, they went to jail, they, they, they did their time. Uh, that's, that's their version of paying their debt to society. But in, in the court of public opinion, it's hard to do so. So the group called Welcome Back did a presentation and I suggest you guys check that out. It is pretty in depth uh, about it as well. So um, I don't, um, yeah, there's really not, <laughs> I'm running really out of time. And one of the big things I also wanted to mention just before I wrapped up was, is that they're gonna be improving um, the road um, near Sussex Street. And so here's a quick peek of what they wanna do. And so if you actually take a look in this particular area, they're gonna put a roundabout on South Avenue to connect Stevens and more, and then also be able to create mixed use parking spaces in the area in which the road slashes through uh, north of Sentinel. So that's pretty much it for <laughs> my city council report and uh, I guess for my show. So without further ado, I wanna thank you guys for joining me this morning. I hope you guys uh, have a wonderful week. And if you wanna know what's going on in Missoula, you can go, go to missoulaevents.net. So for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramph. Have a good weekend, guys.